Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, Chapter 6. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabalin Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided, guided, excuse me, a water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it up by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake and let the tail wave frantically. A far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet, and row on row of tiny wind waves flood up the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died, and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off down river. The little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Then he came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. The little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him. His head jerked up, and he strained toward the sound with eyes and ears until he saw the bird, and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he finished, he sat down on the bank at the side of the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the top of the mountain seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Then he said softly, I didn't forget you, Beck. Goddamn. Just hide in the brush away for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George's going to give me hell, he said. George's going to wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountaintops. I'm going to go right out there and find a cave, he said, and continued sadly. I never have no catch-up, but I don't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. And then from out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses, and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets, and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips, and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke, it was in Lenny's voice. I told you and told you, she said. I told you, mind George, because he's such a nice fellow and good to you. But you don't ever take no care. You do bad things. And then he answered her, I tried, Aunt Claire, ma'am, I tried and tried, I couldn't help it. You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He'd been doing nice things for you all the time. When you got a piece of pie, you always got half or more than half. And if there was any ketchup, why, well, you'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Claire, ma'am, I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time, he could have had such a good time if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in a whorehouse. And he could have sat in the pool room and played snooker. But he got to take care of you. Then he moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Claire, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills and I'll find a cave. And I'll live there, so I won't be no more trouble to George. You just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that. And you know, son of a bitch and well, you ain't never going to do it. You just stick around and steal the bejesus out of George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. Aunt Claire was gone. From out of Lenny's head, there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and tickled its nose at him, and it spoke in Lenny's voice, too. Tend rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard, you ain't fit to lick the boots of no rabbit. You'd forget him and let him go hungry. That's what you'd do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a greased jack pin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George's going to let you tend rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He's going to beat hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's going to do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently. He ain't neither. George won't do nothing like that. I've knew George since I forget when, and he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't going to be mean. He's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's going to beat hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't, and he cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know George. Me and him travels together. The rabbit repeated softly over and over. He's going to leave you, you crazy bastard. He's going to leave you all alone. He's going to leave you, crazy bastard. Then he put his hands over his ears. He ain't, I tell you. He ain't, and he cried. Oh, George, George, George. George came quietly out of the brush, and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell are you yelling about? Then he got up on his knees. You ain't going to leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I know it, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Then he said, George? Yeah? I done another bad thing. It don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George? Yeah? Ain't you going to give me hell? Give you hell? Sure, like you always done before, like if I didn't have you, I'd take my fifty bucks. Jesus Christ, Lenny, you can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember every word I say. Why well, ain't you going to say it? George shook himself. 
he said woodenly. If I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous, had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess, he stopped. Go on, said Lenny. And when the end of the month come? When the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George, aren't you going to give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right up in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily. Tell me like you've done before. Tell you what. About the other guys and about us. George said, guys like us got no family. They make a little stake and then they blow it in. They got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. It was just quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because... Because I got you, and, and I got you. We got each other. That's what the kids are hooting hell about us. Then he cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing, and the leaves rustled, and the wind waves flowed up the green pool, and the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Then he removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer, and the evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, tell how it's going to be. George had been listening to the distant sound. For a moment, he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slope of the gabblins. I'm going to get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety, and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head, at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river, and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised his, the gun in his hand and shook. He dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it going to be? We're going to get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll have maybe a pig and chickens. And down the flat, we'll have a little piece of alfalfa. For the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, he repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits, and you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness and lived on the fat of the land. Yes. Then he turned his head. No, Lenny, look down there across the river like you can almost see the place. Then he obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When are we going to do it? We're going to do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody going to be nice to you. Ain't going to be no more trouble. Nobody going to hurt nobody nor steal from him. Then he said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny, I ain't mad. I've never been mad, and I ain't now. That's the thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, let's do it now. Let's get that place now. Sure, right now. I gotta. We gotta. George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him back up the, on the bank near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with cries and with the sound of running feet. Some's voice shouted, George, where you at, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing, and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand. Got him, by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. The guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it, he asked. I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got it away from him, and you took it, and you killed him? Yeah, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George el George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you will go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, you had it, George. I swear you had it. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them. And Carlson said, now what the hell you suppose? He's eating them two guys.